make it hello and welcome i'm dan your friendly fishmonger and this is a fish nerd geek out live stream i'm glad you could make it thanks for being here um we do this every wednesday night at uh, 7 p.m mountain time and i'm excited to be with you today i have some cool things to talk to you about so last wednesday is the first week that i was not live and i think it's been like I don't know, a year, two years, something like that. We're on our, what, 122nd live stream, and I uh, haven't missed one forever, but last week I did because I had an opportunity to attend the, um, the Aquarium Veterinarian Conference to learn about fish health, fish disease, uh, treatment, nutrition, handling, things like that, and I thought it was a great opportunity not to be missed, so I was there instead of here. And I'll be over the next few live streams. I'll be sharing with you some uh, interesting things that I learned there. It was definitely worth going. It was so worth the 40, 45 bucks that it cost. Um, I was able to learn some things that'll be helpful to me as a fish keeper and a fish seller and importer and all those things. And I was able to get a lot of things clarified, stuff that. I've wondered about or I've heard about or is kind of lore and mythology and stuff you hear in this hobby but you're never quite sure of so that was really good um, for me it was totally worth it. it was a wonderful experience they're planning on holding it again next year and if they do I would highly recommend anyone that can attend do attend because I'm not not every lecture or presentation um, was something that I was really into, but there was lots of different presentations. So all combined in aggregate, um, there was a lot to learn. So I thought it was worthwhile. And I hope they do do it next year. It is online, it's an e-conference, so it's like a Zoom type thing. I think they use an Adobe software or yeah, some kind of, <laughs> some kind of software um, and it worked really well it was I didn't have any problems getting on I didn't have any problems seeing anything it, it seemed to flow pretty smoothly so I was really glad to attend so I'll talk to you about a couple things that I learned or got clarified from that I'll tell you about the shipping report uh, what I how stuff survived that I sent out I did get some stuff in today, so I'll tell you about that. And then we'll get to your questions and comments. If you have questions about keeping aquarium fish, breeding or raising aquarium fish, building fish rooms, all that kind of stuff, um, shipping fish, these are all areas where I feel like I can add some value or just general questions about aquarium fish as well. I can't answer everything. There are some things that or out of my line of expertise and if they are I'll just tell you that I'm not the guy for that I try to only go in depth on things that I actually have first-hand experience with as opposed to just repeating stuff that I heard somewhere through the grapevine um, so that's that's what I'll share with you and if I am sharing stuff with you that I don't have direct experience with then I'll be upfront about that so you kind of know to not trust what I'm saying completely you'll need to verify right um, all right, so a couple things that I, I had clarified or, or learned about this. Um, one is something that we've known for quite a while, uh, at least I've heard quite a while, but it was nice to have an actual expert clarify it and say that it's true, is that uh, fish sex is determined by temperature. Now, I don't know if that's every species or only a select number of species, but um, the vets there, there was a presentation on breeding and raising fish, and um, they definitely said that, yes, that is true. So again, I, they weren't clear on if it's all species or not, but it did give hope. I've heard lots of things. I've heard that pH affects temperature. I've heard hardness and all these things, but to have some actual experts say that temperature is what affects the sex um, at least gives us a starting point so if you're breeding guppies or killifish or whatever uh, this happens a lot in wild type bettas and killifish and you're getting all one sex in the spawns then you might want to bump your temperature up a few degrees or lower your temperature a few degrees and that might help even out the sex ratio so that's stuff that I had heard about 
but I've heard lots of different things about sex determination. So it's nice to get it from uh, the vet's mouth. It turns out that fish are not like you and I, you know, XX or XY chromosome. Um, the, the sex there is not determined by chromosome, it's determined in development. So it's not predetermined, so it is a little bit fluid. So that was uh, interesting to hear. Another thing that, that I thought was really cool was I got some clarification on spirulina or spirulina algae as a food. So I've been feeding spirulina for a while, but I, I heard a presentation at a fish club in Florida a while ago and the speaker was someone who, I'm going to turn down my volume, I see it's peaking. Um, hopefully that's still loud enough. If, if not, let me know. Let me know, guys, if it's if I need to turn it down more or not. It looks like what I just said it to is pretty good, but uh, let me know. Anyway, um, there was a speaker at a club in Florida that was talking about feeding fish. And this is someone that's bred and raised lots of fish. It does this for a living has a lot of experience and is very analytical um, thinks of a lot of things through first principles and such so I tend to when this person speaks I tend to listen and they were talking about feeding spirulina and how um, they didn't think that there was value in it they stopped feeding it to their fish because they thought that a lot of that was just wasted that the fish would not digest it well and it would just mess up the tank clog the filters and just be a big mess so i heard that and i started thinking about it and i was like i wonder if that's true i hadn't really noticed that in my own feeding but during this conference there was an expert on fish nutrition that gave a presentation someone who's worked at large fish food companies and really been doing that for decades developing formulas for fish and things like that and is a veterinarian as well if I remember correctly. So has all the background of health and, and nutrition and things. And they were saying, no, spirulina is an excellent food. It's high in healthy proteins, high in healthy fats, high in amino acids. Um, and that, um, that they would recommend it highly. And something that I had heard a long time ago but had forgotten and was reminded of in this presentation was that uh, spirulina doesn't have a cell wall. So it doesn't have cellulose, that, that hard cell wall that plants have that makes them good building material and really hard to digest. Um, it doesn't have that. So it's actually really easily digestible for most fish. So that was good to get clarification on that. Um, apart from that, there was one presentation that was really helpful. Well, there were, there were several. But one specifically went over fish parasites. It went over external parasites and internal parasites and parasites in the gills. and gave a lot of information about their life cycles, um, about how they get into the fish, what they do to a fish, and what we can do to prevent that. And so it was nice, it was great to hear that. Um, it was nice to hear this veterinarian say that a lot of these external parasites can be treated with um, formalin-based medicines, which is what um, Mardell Quick Cure and Hikari Ikex and things like that are. So it was nice to know that I was on the right track with that. And his recommendation was that if you're running into ick or external uh, parasites, um, and I think some of the parasites in the gills as well, I'll have to check that, but his regimen was um, treating with formalin every other day for about a week or so, depending on temperature. We all know the X life cycle and, and all these parasites life cycles are largely driven by temperature. So, But in the typical tropical temperatures that we keep fish, that was his recommendation. So that was kind of nice to hear him say that. Um, I've generally been treating every day for a week with um, ICX or Mardell Quick Cure, whichever I can find at the best price, honestly. They're both very good medicines. And so it was nice to hear that maybe I could cut that down to every other day and still have a pretty good result. Um, it'll cost less because it'll use less medicine um, and it'll stress the fish less because every time you use a medicine, the fish has to metabolize that medicine and um, 
you don't want to expose that fish to more medicine than it needs to be exposed to. It can be hard on the fish, just like on you and I. Um, so that was really cool to hear. Um, and there were some other things that I'll, I'll get into more in depth later. I, we, I haven't got the, uh, they're sending a link so that we can rewatch. So I'll be uh, rewatching all the presentations carefully the second time around to pick up the bits I missed or, or wasn't quite clear on. Um, there were times when I was having to, I was working on packing up fish and I missed a couple presentations or I had an import come in and so I had to land those and I missed some stuff. I had it on in the background but I, I didn't get everything. So I'm looking forward to doing that and I'll, I'll share some little tidbits with you as we, as we go along. The one thing that really stuck with me from this presentation is for all the internal parasites, um, it was highly recommended that we use medicated foods. That I, I asked specifically about Camelinus uh, redworm and using levamisole in a bath. And they were like, well, you know, you know, if that's your only option, yes, but uh, if you can use a medicated food, it's a lot more effective according to this presentation or this veterinarian. Um, and that uh, you'll use a lot less medicine, so that's a win all around. So, what I've done is I've, I've ordered a gram scale. Um, I have a pretty good scale, but when it gets to grams, it gets a little funky. It's, not, it's more for mailing than, than, um, <laughs> than cooking meth. I guess. <laughs> so it's more for uh, weighing packages to mail than, than really fine, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of a gram measurement. So I've ordered a very sensitive gram scale so I can um, start. In this presentation, this veterinarian gave all the dosing uh, for all these medicines to combat different parasites. So um, I'm going to start really figuring out the best way to make rapashi with these medicines embedded in it so that I can start doing that more. Um, I do have some flake foods that I bought um, that are medicated, but my issue with them is the moment I put them in the water, I see the medicines dropping off the flake food. Most medicines are, are bound to salt. And so I put the food in and I literally see salt grains dropping off the food before the fish eat it. So it makes me question how effective uh, those foods are, are basically in that form. I'm, I'm thinking that if I can make a gel food um, that actually has the medicine embedded inside it instead of on the, on the surface of a flake, that it'll retain the medicine better and I'll probably be able to get the medicine into the fish more effectively. So I'm going to start messing with that quite a bit and I'll let you guys know how it goes. Um, so I, I have had success with with baths, um, like using levamisole in a bath instead of in, having the fish ingest it to treat camelinus red worms. Um, live bears often come in with them Every time I get Burmese clouded archer fish in, they have Camelinus red worms, and so I have successfully treated that with Levamisol. Um, I've treated hole in the head with metronidazole in a bath solution. So I, I know baths can work, but it seems like the best thing is going to be to um, to try to find a really effective way to get the food inside the fish, if we're talking about internal parasites. So um, those are a few of the things I came away with. Um, so quick shipping report. It's been two weeks since I've seen you all. So the two week report is that everything, as far as I know, that I sent since I last saw you arrived alive with the exception of one fish today. I had my first casualty today that I've heard about in several weeks. Um, it was a Celebes rainbow, and the buyer said that it looked like it had got caught in the corner of the bag. Um, even though I crimped the corners of the bags to try to prevent that, it looks like in this case that wasn't, somehow something happened in route. Um, maybe the bag 
bled air and got a little flaccid and crunched down. I, I don't know. There wasn't a video or anything. But um, so we did have one casualty, but that is the only casualty that I can remember in the last several weeks. So um, we're on track to break, I think, our record from last year. Last year we had over 99% success with fish arriving alive and as far as I know staying alive and doing well um, long term. In fact, I think it was 99.5% somewhere around there. And so far this year with the FedEx overnight shipping, it's going even better. So I'm excited about that. Um, about shipping, for those of you that live in areas where it's getting really hot, Arizona, uh, maybe some parts of Florida, southern Texas, things like that. Um, pit parts of California, Bakersfield. <laughs> um, I know it's getting hot. So if you live in an area like that, then there's a couple things I'm doing. One is I'm, I'm sending them um, overnight priority so that hopefully they'll get to you by 10 a.m. or at least before noon. Now, there are some people that live far enough away from um, a, a FedEx office that even priority isn't going to get it there in the morning. But generally, if I send it FedEx overnight priority instead of FedEx overnight standard, um, unless you live far out in the boondocks or far away from a FedEx hub, um, it'll get to you by 10 a.m. or by noon. So my hope is that by sending that way, it, it'll get to you before it gets too hot. Another thing we can do is if you live in a really hot area where it's just getting toasty is if you will check with your local FedEx office and make sure that they'll hold packages for pickup um, when you check out if you place an order you can leave a note at checkout and say please have them held for pickup and I'll do that that's easy that is check a box as I'm preparing your order for shipping and they'll hold it the reason I'm um, asking you to please check is because there was a lady a couple weeks ago who asked them to be held for pickup and I was like sure no problem and I went to ship her fish and the hold for pickup option was not available I couldn't do it um, it just wherever she lived it, 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 FedEx didn't have that option available and so um, luckily everything turned out okay, she got the fish, they all lived, it was all okay, but you know, she was planning on them being held and they end up having to be delivered, and I didn't know that until I was literally creating the, the postage, you know, the label to put on the box, like half an hour before FedEx, the FedEx deadline, so I didn't really have time to, <laughs> to, to do much about it except for send them and then contact her later and say, look, I guess... I, I'm sorry, but I couldn't hold them for pickup, but almost always we can. So if you would be so kind, if you live in a really hot area to check and make sure there's a FedEx location close to you where you can have them held and then request that, then I can have them held there. They'll be more or less in a temperature controlled environment. Um, here I can pick them up as early as 10 a.m. in the morning from a location like that. So. That's another way to kind of beat the heat, if you will. So those are just some thoughts um, about shipping as, as weather changes. This week, I, I, there were only two boxes that I had to put heat packs in. One was a box of discus, and they like it pretty toasty. And where it was going, it wasn't necessarily going to be toasty, at least not in the nighttime. And so I did put a small heat pack in there. And then there was another box going to somewhere in the north where it's still pretty cold. So I put a heat pot pack in that box. But we're pretty, we're getting to the point where, um, I mean, weather can fluctuate a little bit still, but to where heat packs aren't as necessary, which is super nice. But now we have to worry about the heat. So just some thoughts about how to do that. Um, I did get a couple boxes of fish in today, which is exciting. I got a large box full of bushy nose plecos and panda guppies. This was a hobbyist that bred and raised these, and so I uh, sent them to me because he knows I'm looking for fish. And this was this person's first time shipping, and I'm happy to say that um, out of, I don't know, it had to be around 100 fish or so, that only one pleco didn't make it. Everyone else made it and looked great. And that pleco, 
it looked like everything had been done properly, but it got itself, um, you know how when you rubber band or tie bags, the top of the bag, when you squeeze it, gets all these little pleats in it? The Pleco had somehow worked its way into some of those pleats, and then the bag, it looked like it rotated, and the Pleco was stuck in there and couldn't get back down into the water, or just got squished. Somehow it was stuck in those pleats, and uh, so because of that, didn't make the trip. But every other fish did and arrived looking fantastic. So for this person's first time shipping fish, and I won't say their name just because I don't know if they want me to uh, reveal who they are, but I'm pretty sure they're watching or will watch the replay. And so uh, you did a great job. I did film it. When I find a second, I will post the unboxing so folks can see that. But anyway, it was fantastic. Um, I did get, uh, I ordered four boxes of fish for, well, I ordered more. Um, there was four boxes of fish that were sent to me this week for import purposes. However, only one made it. The rest got laid up in Memphis and hopefully will arrive tomorrow. I'm kind of a nervous wreck about it because there's several discus in that shipment and they did not come in the box that made it today. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of really cool fish. There's um, some platinum parrot fish. Uh, or what do they call them? I don't know, it's platinum parrot fish, I think. The white platinum parrot fish. Um, got those because uh, Scott Backer, who's a great customer, asked for some. And I was able to find a, a batch that wasn't too big at a decent price. So I went ahead and ordered them. Um, but those like it warm. and So I'm just a little bit nervous about some of the fish that are stuck in Memphis right now. Hopefully they arrive tomorrow in good shape and everything will be fine. We'll see. The other thing that I'm super excited about is there's a chance I might get a large shipment in from Indonesia on Saturday. So I'm working with the transshipper. Um, it, it looks like that can happen. This is not the wild and locality pure rainbow fish and wild type bettas and stuff. This is a, a different supplier. Um, we have confirmation that they'll arrive to my transshipper Friday, so they should get to me Saturday. Things are still vacillating, though, with airlines and governments and this whole COVID-19 thing. So um, we have confirmation from the company. It looks like everything's clear on their end. As, as long as nothing, oh, as long as none of the many things that could happen happen, <laughs> then um, I should get that on Saturday. So I'm excited about that. Um, I've ordered about 50 bags. So 50 different species um, from this company in Indonesia. And so um, hopefully they arrive. Now, the reason that these aren't the wild type rainbows and wild type bettas and stuff that I'm really, ex uh, really excited about getting as soon as we can is that company, the company that sells all those wild bettas and locality pure rainbows and stuff um, is not in Jakarta. They're off on the other side close to Papua New Guinea which is why they have access to all these things. They have some really cool rice fish species. They, oh, they have awesome stuff. But because of that they're not a direct flight and so because of the logistics of getting the stuff to Jakarta and then getting it sent over here because of that, that layover, there's no reliability yet on that connection. Uh, if we sent the fish, there's no guarantee that they would get on the next flight and get sent to the United States. They, they could be delayed two or three days just sitting on the tarmac. So we just can't take that risk yet. But I'm hopeful that the, the company in Jakarta which I've done a couple test orders from them before this whole COVID-19 thing shut things down and they have so far really good stuff. Uh, I was finally able to get some healthy catfish and things like that from them. Um, it looks like that might work out. So I'm really hopeful that we'll have some good news Saturday. It's been interesting trying to figure out how to get them here on a Saturday because there are no airlines. Again, there's no cargo coming to my area. Nowhere in my state or in the state of Montana is any cargo going. 
So then it was like, okay, it's gotta be UPS or FedEx or something like that. But then Saturday delivery, in case you don't know, is a lot more expensive and quite limited with those two carriers. So I had to uh, get on the horn and, and actually confirm that this was doable. And it's gonna cost, you don't, you don't, you don't want to know what it's going to cost to get them to me on a Saturday, but it's the only day it's going to work because of the limited flights and everything. So we're doing it. So unfortunately, the fish that come on that order are going to be are going to cost more than I would like to charge, just because the shipping is going to be exorbitant. But um, at least, at least there's some hope that things are starting to shake loose a bit. Um, I talked with my uh, one of my suppliers in Nigeria yesterday and this morning. <laughs> the, the time lag uh, makes it for long conversations sometimes. And they're still in partial shutdown, so there's still no movement there. Uh, they're not ready to, well, they're ready. They're not able to export yet. So, but there's some things moving. So I wanna thank everybody that um, reached out and had was was willing to send me fish and let me buy fish from them so that I could have some stock even with all the shutdowns. I really appreciate it. And oh, to that end, I do expect on Friday to receive two species of wild type rainbows. I'm sorry, not rainbows, wild type sword tails. One which originated with Rusty Wetzel and another which originated with Greg Sage. So um, we'll see if that comes through, but I'm hopeful that it will. So there's some exciting stuff happening, although, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a rocky road and I think it'll continue to be a rocky road for a bit, but I'd really like to get this facility filled up and see what it does when it's on full rock and roll. All right, last thing, let's get to the giveaway. I've yammered for half an hour, so let's get to that giveaway. Um, we're giving away some bitterlings today. For those that don't know what a bitterling is, it's a site printed. Uh, it's not a Barb, it's not a Danio, it's nothing like that, but it's in the same kind of group. Um, they're really pretty. These photos don't do them even close to justice. They're much prettier than these photos. This gets there. The, the problem is, and this is like, I've never seen them that colorful. That seems a little bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but this gets there. But the problem is a lot of their color is iridescence and iridescence just doesn't show up well on camera and film. So there's a lot more color than you're seeing here, but this is giving you an idea of the blues and purples and reds that are on this fish. The batch I have is amazing. It's been really hardy from day one. I think I've got a hundred and some, a hundred plus of them. May, there might have been one loss early on, but they've been rock solid. Usually when I get bitterlings in, they're a struggle. It, it's hard to get them up and running properly. And uh, it's just because they, they, aren't, they aren't treated as well as they should be on the export side. But again, I got a new supplier, tried them, and this batch came in fantastic. So whoever I got them from, uh, that, that supplier knows how to treat them. And it's a big colorful group, they're hardy, I think they're doing great. Now, if you don't know bitterlings, the thing they're famous for is how they spawn. So this is a female, this is a male, this is her breeding tube, it's super long. And the way she spawns is she injects that tube into a shellfish, say clam or a mussel, lays her eggs inside the, the, the shellfish, and then the male squirts his milt on the intake of the shellfish to uh, fertilize them. In that way, their eggs can develop in this, you know, armored bunker, basically, and are safe from predation. So they're a really interesting fish reproductively. And they don't need a heater. They like it cold. Um, I checked the temperature on the tank right before the live stream, and they're at 76 degrees right now. Um, and they'll overwinter just fine. So if you have a tank in an unheated basement or something like that uh, and you don't want to use a heater, this is a great cold water fish. They can take it up. I've kept them up to 78 with no problems. I've never tried to keep them warmer than that. They might be able to go warmer than that. Um, they're a temperate species, so it gets cold in the winter, but in the summer it gets warm enough that you and I could probably swim in the water they're living in. Um, 
so it's not like they have to be kept cold all the time, but the thing they need for sure is good oxygenation in the water. So if you don't keep your tank very clean, and there's a lot of organic decomp going on in the tank, and the temperature gets high, there's not going to be enough oxygen saturation in that water available for the fish, and that's when they're going to really struggle. I think that if you keep um, your tank pretty clean of decaying organic solids and keep a few air stones going and good flow and things, that they could be fine at temperatures even higher than 78. I've just not tried it. So that's what the giveaway is. Um, and to if you'd like to be entered to win the Rosie Bitterlings, then here's how you do that. You enter hashtag no heater <laughs> in the chat. Hashtag no heater. N-O-H-E-A-T-E-R. All right. And you will be entered to win. And later on, we'll draw the winner. And if you win, I'll just send them to you on Monday. All right. So uh, with that, I am going to get to your questions and comments. And um, let's see, I think that's, oh, a victory. All the discus that were sent arrived alive and kicking. They're in pretty good shape. So um, it's nice to get discus again. It's been a long time. People have been asking me for years if I'm going to get them again. I keep saying no because I like to heat the room instead of heating the tanks and I keep this room in the mid to upper 70s generally sometimes 80 or a little above in the heat of the summer for a little bit and so I just didn't want to get the everything all set up but I was cleaning out some uh, storage tubs a few weeks ago a month ago something like that and I came across my old heaters and thermostats and stuff that I use for some discus setups back in the day and so I went ahead and I heated up a, a couple tanks so I'll be able to keep a couple different kinds of discus um, I don't know if I'll keep them long term I don't know how deep we'll go into it but for now I've got at least a few the blue turquoise are doing great I also got a um, a large like good size blue diamond turquoise and red melon and they're they're good size. They're they're adults for sure. So, yeah, stuff's moving on that front. I don't know how deep we'll get into it though. Um, all right. So I'm going to start with the questions and comments because I've been yammering on for 34 minutes now, um, and chat only lets me scroll up to a certain point. That means that if you left a question or comment early on, then uh, then I probably can't see it. So the first, let me show you what I mean. So this is as far up as I can scroll in the chat. It won't let me go further than this. So the first comment I can see is this one, Young Fish Aquatics. So that's what I'm going to start with. If you left your question or comment before that, please list it again uh, so that I can see it. Young Fish Aquatics, can you put the Platinum Parrots on Get Gills? Oh, I totally will, but they haven't arrived yet. They're um, delayed in Memphis. So they should arrive tomorrow. Oh, geez, I hope they arrive tomorrow. <laughs> They've been in the bag a while. And hopefully they're still in good shape even after the shipping delay. And if they are and they do well, then they'll be listed for sale about two weeks after I get them. If they aren't, um, then it could take longer. You know, it just depends on how they come in. The, the fish determine the quarantine period, but it's a minimum of two weeks. Um, but once they're ready to go, I'll definitely list them. The fish tank barn threw down five bucks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for letting me know about the class. Really got a lot out of it. And I'm glad you could attend. I, I thought it was pretty cool. And for 40 bucks, I thought it was a steal. But you're most welcome. I was tickled to hear about it, and I was glad that they did it, and I could get the the news out. Chattanooga Ed. Oh, the fox cat is not punching me in the face this time. The fox cat is giving me a golf clap. <laughs> Thanks for the five bucks, Ed. I really appreciate it. And and I didn't even have to get bruised. I didn't even have to get my chin bruised. That's uh, that's awesome. <laughs> 
Jeff Chambers, can you ever get in an L number Pleco order from Brazil since they are exporting again? Oh, that's that's good news that people might not know about. So the Brazilian government recently, very recently, um, changed the law and Brazil is going to start exporting fish again. I've read the law and um, it looks like they're going to make a real effort to make sure that the fish are harvested sustainably. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're forbidding the use of any kind of toxins in fish collection and things like that. So the law reads really nicely. It, it reads as a very responsible, sustainable way to collect fish a la Project Piaba in, in other projects like that that, that have, I think influenced the government's decision a little bit. That being said, um, I don't know how much that law will be enforced or anything like that, but it looks like they're on the right track. So Brazil is opening up. Of course, with COVID-19, there's going to be very limited exports from Brazil for a little while. Um, but Jeff, I'm definitely aware of Brazil opening up. I'm keeping a very close eye on it. Again, I don't know how soon the whole export system will be in place and flights will be leaving regularly and all that. But once they are, I do plan on bringing some stuff in from Brazil. Um, Colombia is, is Colombia still closed? Uh, Peru, Peru, I got a message from my supplier in Peru today and they are shipping out. The problem is they're only shipping to one airport right now and that's Miami. So I'm going to look into that a little bit deeper to see if, if it's worth doing and if I can figure out a way to make it work. But the problem is a fish from Brazil that has really soft water, generally, go to Miami. If I have a transshipper do a water change, which I will have to have them do, because there's no direct flights to me, so there's a layover and I don't want the fish to be sitting there without a water change. So I'll work with the transshipper. If that transshipper changes the water and uses Florida water, then the fish are gonna go from really soft water to really hard water, and they'll get sent back to me. And that's not a big problem. Fish can go from soft water to hard water. In fact, hard water has a lot of electrolytes and stuff in it that helps fish during the stress of shipping. But the problem is then that bag comes to me, I have really soft water. So that fish has gone from hard, soft water to hard water, then it comes to me, I have soft water. Fish have a really hard time going from hard water to soft water. The reverse is fine, but going back to soft water is pretty brutal on them. And so um, I'm pretty nervous about bringing fish in and having them having a transshipper in Florida receive them, change the water, and then send them to me. I'd much rather have it go through uh, someone else that has softer water or that I know is aware of the situation and will give them the, a water change with the proper parameters. So that's something I have to work through. That's, that's the rub in all of that. Same with Peru and Colombia. Um, until they open back up and are shipping to more than one airport, to more than Miami, there's some logistics I have to figure out, and I don't know how possible that will be, but I'm trying. Sand Creek Aquatics, I'm an hour from Memphis. I can pick them up. Let's, oh, from FedEx, yes. Every now and then I'm like, I should move to Memphis because it's the best place to ship fish from. <laughs> but... <laughs> Electro Fry, you said you're working with Greg Sage on filling up the stock. No, no, no. I'm not working with Greg Sage directly. I know Greg Sage. I like Greg Sage. Um, I've been to his house and stuff. What I'm saying is that one of the sword tales that might come Friday originated with his stock. So this person got them from Greg Sage and has bred a few generations and now has some to sell. To sell. Not that I'm buying directly from Greg Sage. Um, Greg doesn't need me to buy directly from him. He's so busy he can't even keep up with demand, not even remotely. <laughs> a lot of his fish have like a year-long waiting list. So um, yeah, Greg definitely doesn't need me to buy his fish and sell for him. He's 
he has a hard time keeping up with the demand because he's that good. Uh, Maria Z, what are they comparable with at Dan's Fish? Maria, I'm assuming you're asking compatible with, and I'm going to assume that we're talking about the bitterlings. I would treat them like a Danio or a rainbow fish. Not aggressive, but very active. Um, or a barb, although I hesitate to say barb because when I say barb, people think of tiger barbs, they think of nipped fins, they think of aggression. They're not an aggressive fish. They're a quick fish. So I would keep them with anything that they won't outcompete for food. So that's, that's the big, um, in my mind, that's the limiting factor there. If you had a big group of bitterlings and you kept them in with, say, some, I don't know, wild type bettas. There are lots of wild type bettas that like cooler temperatures, low, high 60s, low 70s. The issue there is that the bitterlings would be so fast to the food that the wild type bettas would have, I think, a hard time getting enough nutrition. And you'd have to overfeed a ton until the bitterlings were so satiated that some food got down to those bedas. And that's not a good situation. So that's avoiding situations like that, as long as that's done, I think they can go with pretty much anything. I haven't tried them with long finned fish, so I don't know if they would nip fins on like fancy guppies or bedas, long finned bedas, things like that. Um, I've kept them with Corydoras. I've kept them with uh, um, Balzani, the, the humphead cichlids, because those like cooler temperatures. Uh, they were great dither fish for the Balzani, Gymnogeophagus Balzani cichlids. So, yeah, I guess that's the guideline I would use. Something that uh, likes it cooler and doesn't get out competed for food easily. And I hope that uh, I answered your question. <laughs> Herp diversity, are they safe with Ember Tetras? If you're asking about the, um, the bitterlings, I would say yes with a caveat that they're large, fully grown Ember Tetras. Like any fish, the bitterlings are going to eat anything they can just grab and swallow. Um, however, they don't have very large mouths for the size of fish that they are. So I think it would be fine as long as the Ember Tetras are good sized, big chunky ones. <laughs> big. There's no Ember Tetras that's big, but it's full grown and, and you know well fed. Diana Connor, are they bred in captivity? The bitterlings, not, I highly doubt it. Uh, because of the specialized breeding, I, I would be very surprised if the bitterlings that I have for sale were, were aquarium bred and raised. I, I, I bet that they were collected. Which brings up another cool thing that I learned at this uh, aquarium veterinarian conference, which is, and take these stats with a grain of salt. This is just one guy's presentation that said this. I haven't verified it or anything, but something that I suspected for a long time, 95% of the fish in the industry are farmed. Only 5% are wild collected. So that's good news in a way, right, for habitat preservation and, and not for habitat presentation, for species uh, not being over collected in the wild. But the problem is it doesn't promote habitat preservation. Uh, like sustainable fisheries for collecting does. So, but that was interesting. 95% of the fish are farmed, 5% wild collected. And then of the farmed portion, 60% are farmed in Asia, 40% in the United States. And I actually think that's, I think it's higher. I think more than 60% are farmed in Asia. The reason I say that is something that this presenter might not know is lots of the farms are no longer breeding and raising fish for sale. A lot of them are now distribution points that are buying from Asia and reselling. And the ones that are breeding and raising their fish, a lot of them are at least a portion of their operation, I'm not saying all of it, but some of them probably, are buying young fish from Asia or other places 
and raising them up and then reselling them. So true Florida farm fish, I bet it's less than 40%, honestly. I don't have any real facts to back that up other than I know a lot of farms in places that if you visit their websites or, or talk to people that deal with them would think that these people are raising their own fish when in fact they're buying young fish from breeders in Asia and other places, raising them up, them up and reselling them. So I bet it's more than that that are farmed in Asia. But that was just an interesting little tidbit. Chattanooga Ed, does this, the shellfish die? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe it kills the shellfish. Um, they the eggs uh, are in the shellfish the in the valve and the shellfish is continually breathing in fresh water and so the eggs have clean water and lots of oxygen and when they hatch I think they just go right out the vent yeah, as far as I know I've never bred them in captivity I tried once or twice years and years and years ago but I could never get the darn clams to stay alive <laughs> In fact, most of the time the clams just arrived in a stinky mess. There was, yeah, never really had the chance to play with that like I would have wanted. Alrighty. Chat jumped on me as it does. Hang on. Trying to find where we were. Sorry about that. There's an echo. Greg Gale says there's an echo. It sound okay, folks? I'm gonna go right down to the bottom here real quick, um, so you folks can tell me is is the sound okay? If it's not, let me know so I can fix it. Hopefully, I haven't been going this whole time with bad sound. That would be no good. I'll just wait just a sec so someone can let me know. Because if there is a sound problem, I want to fix it right away. There's nothing worse than listening to a live stream and, uh, <laughs> and it's horribly muffled and stuff and the person streaming doesn't know. Sounds fine. No echo. Okay. Okay. Cool. So whoever left that comment, that might be on your end. It sounds like for other folks it's, it's going fine. But I appreciate you letting me know. Um, I always like it when people let me know about that stuff. Uh, Greg, thanks for letting me know. Instead of me just going on my weary, merry way and no one telling me anything. Because if it was on my side, I would really want to know. Gary's Aquatics. If I win, just send them to Bob. It can go with Dharma. <laughs> what did the bitterlings do to you, Gary's Aquatics? <laughs> I bet they would last about... 10 seconds with Dharma. Dragon Lair, you'll never get far enough back in the chat to see my comment. You're right, but I saw that one, so if you leave another one, then maybe I will. We've still got 40 minutes. I might get there. Fishkeeper Cole, I know you did two videos on your Santa Maria Endler project, but can you go into some detail about the overall process of getting a solid strain that only produces one kind of Endler? Thanks. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so the, the trick, or what you have to do to make that happen, is control which genetics are passed on. So the easiest way, I think, to do that is to, if, you, if there's some males, and I say males specifically just because it's easier to see the color pattern and everything on a male, right? Usually that's what we're going for. Females are important too, but um, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble here, but um, males, the colors are easy to see. Fin shapes are, you know, if you have different fin shapes and stuff, that's where they're going to be manifest more than in females. So the way I developed the Santa Maria Endlers was I had male Santa Maria Endlers, could not for the life of me get females. This was a few years ago. Um, but I had a really nice strain of tequila sunrise guppies. And I thought the colors would kind of complement. So I bred the female sunrise, I'm sorry, tequila sunrise guppies with 
the male Santa Maria endlers. And for all of you that are freaking out that a hybridized fish, Santa Maria endlers are hybridized. Um, that's how they were first created. So they're already hybrid. I wasn't mudding up like a genetically pure species pure um, line of fish. So Santa Maria endlers are hybrids no matter where you get them from. So what I would do is uh, bred the males to those females. They dropped babies, took the females out and as soon as I could sex those little fry as they grew up, I would remove all the males. So only the females were left with the original male Santa Marias and they bred with those females again. Then as soon as those females dropped their fry, I would remove them. And so I was making sure that the only thing that bred with each successive generation of females was those original males. And over time, enough of those original males genetics got concentrated in the strain that it bred out pure. Now, alarms are going off in a lot of people's heads talking about, that's inbreeding. You're right, that is inbreeding. And inbreeding is really the only way to set a strain. However, I wasn't doing this with just one tank of fish. I had several different males in their own tanks they had their own females in there. And what I would do is I would rotate males to different tanks. So the females were never actually breeding the, the F1 or F2 or F3 generation, so on of females were never breeding back with the original males that started the entire line. They were being bred to, you know, uncles and things like cousins, stuff like that. So, it's still inbreeding, but it's not as bad as direct parent to sibling for several generations. And then over time, you find someone else that has some Santa Marias that has good genetics, um, and you swap out some of your males and put some of theirs in there. And you, you, you know, you can diversify genetics a little bit that way. But the original way to set a strain is by, unfortunately, intense inbreeding, um, making sure that the fish that have the traits you're trying to set in the strain are the only ones impregnating each generation of females. And after a couple years, <laughs> it takes a while, you'll finally get a pure strain. So Fish Keeper Cole, I hope that answers the question. Um, but that's kind of the principle. So you want to, you have to inbreed and then you want to occasionally cross in some new blood Hopefully it was something that is already set, but is from someone else, so it just has a little bit different genetics. Now, that being said, there are lines of live bearers that have been going for decades that started with a, a group of a few and have just been going and going and going. And they're healthy and they're doing great because they're being cold, right? So they're, anything that's deformed is removed, anything that's unhealthy is removed. So even though you're inbreeding, you can keep a strain in fairly good shape if you're doing a good job as a breeder, um, only selecting the best fish as brood stock. Maria Z, nice, I may have to set up another tank. Maria Z is doing her part for world peace, setting up more aquariums. Dragon Lair wants the bitterlings if someone wins them and doesn't want them. Rockford Fishkeeping, get discus, no. Get discus, no. These are the discus you were looking for. <laughs> discus for sale. Okay, it took me a while, but as soon as you said these are the discus you're looking for, I, I finally got it. <laughs> Hope they do well for you. I really do, and I think they will. They came in um, and you know, there was a delay in that shipment and they came in really cold, so I was worried, but they perked up really quick. And they've been eating, doing well, no signs of disease or anything. They've been dewormed. Um, I think they're going to do good for you. Killers Aquatics, WFA, no problem. You'll have to tell him then and be sure to use a dance fish so he sees you. Yes, WFA. Um, so I missed something. Young Fish Aquatics, if I win, give them to Sandy Creek. Sorry, Bob. Oh, no love. No love for Kayla's Aquatics. I love you, Bob, even if uh, Young Fish Aquatics doesn't. 
<laughs> but yeah, leave leave stuff uh, in a comment that highlights so I can see it. Just one more fish with Josh. Someone finally convinced me to ship all to ship fish. All arrived in great shape and are still good as of this morning. Flash forward to this week, sent out seven boxes of fish, two sold on get gills. Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad you're shipping fish. I'm glad it's going well. Um, just, just know, Josh, that every now and then, hopefully it's very seldom, but every now and then something will be out of your, your control and it's just statistics. There will come a time when a fish does not do well. There, sometimes there's a time when an entire box doesn't do well because of how it was treated when it was out of your hands. So just just saying that so that when that happens you don't feel like oh I'm horrible what I do wrong and all that sometimes you didn't do anything wrong it's just stuff's out of your control but I'm glad that it's going well that's awesome welcome to get gills and thanks for uh, all the plants and stuff that you've added to giveaways um, over the last you know several months I appreciate it oh by the way uh, if Michael Wentworth is watching thanks so much as well for doing that and um, I heard back from, I believe it was Moonstone, that the plants all arrived and everything went really well, so thanks for doing that. For those that don't know what we're talking about, um, every now and then someone wants to add to the giveaway, and so uh, Just One More Fish with Josh and Michael Wentworth both did that recently, so thanking them. Lefty, 3213A, how are the female bettas doing? Okay. Um, all the ones, so I, yeah, they're doing pretty good. Um, I'll be doing a video of them uh, as soon as I can, and you can see them and select the ones you want. The problem is sometimes I have to put new fish in a tank with the female betta. Um, and so then I don't want to release that beta for another week or so for sale because I want to make sure that the fish I put her with or put in with her uh, don't have any any problem right so even though the female bettas are doing great and are ready to sell when I get a fish out of the quarantine system and put them in with the female beta for the first time then I feel like I have to wait another week or two just to make sure that nothing was introduced there. So it's going to take a little longer, I think, um, to get them listed for sale than I originally thought. Just because now orders are coming in, I am getting more fish in, and so I'm filling up the tanks that they're in, and I want to be cautious about that. So when I hesitate there, it's not because there are any problems. There aren't. They're doing great. Um, the ones out there are doing fine. But it's because I, I just want to be cautious. Whenever I put a new group of fish in with fish that are already in the tank, then I kind of have to restart the quarantine process again. So, yeah. Now, I do have female bettas in a sorority as well, and most of them are doing really well. There are a few that are a little shaky in there. So, um, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to help them. <laughs> But all in all, they're doing really well. And all the ones in individual tanks are doing great. Michael Brandel, I thought the conference was great. I'm glad you could go. Day three and four were the most interesting for me. Yeah, me too. Uh, the presentation on the fish industry, I thought was really cool. Um, the stuff on diseases and medications and all that was really interesting. Yeah, the first couple days, there was a lot about... Um, Oh, different things, um, quarantine procedures, how to isolate fish, stuff like that, which, which was interesting, but already stuff that in general I think I was pretty familiar with. But you're right, the last couple days were really, really good. And I thought the breeding stuff was cool. There was a guy that's breeding and raising all kinds of marine fish for the, um, you know, salties for all you that keep saltwater aquariums and I thought it was cool it wasn't all directly applicable to freshwater fish but they did go into depth on how they raise live food cultures and things like that to to feed all these little tiny little 
little plankton, basically, which is what a marine fish is until it settles out. And um, So that was pretty cool. But I'm glad you could go, Michael Brandel. Glad you won and could make it. Electro Fry, I don't remember where my first question was, but it was early. Asked if you consider aquarium salt a medicinal product, or would you ever recommend using it on the regular? So, kind of, it depends on your uh, definition of medicinal. Here's what salt does. Salt helps a fish regulate its osmotic system. <laughs> so, I don't know that salt definitely treats any disease. I don't know that. I've never heard anyone with actual degrees and, and certifications in fish health say that, that salt treats disease. What salt does is frees up the fish to use its energy to fight diseases. I'll be really brief about it because I've talked about this quite a bit, but the brief part is freshwater fish are constantly fighting to keep fresh water from rushing into their bodies, into their cells. Freshwater fish are salty. Their blood is salty. Their tissue is salty, just like you and me. And they're surrounded by fresh water. So that fresh water wants to invade the fish. In fact, sometimes it does, and that's what we call dropsy. Dropsy can be severe organ failure where the internal organs are swelled up, but often it's just loss of the ability to regulate, um, to, to maintain homeostasis, to, to, reg to keep fresh water from entering the fish. And when that happens, the fish just blows up in pine cones. So that's what dropsy is. So you've got this fish, which is constantly fighting to keep fresh water from entering its body. That takes a lot of energy. Um, in fact, in, the, in one of the presentations, they mentioned exactly how much energy it is, and I can't remember, but it's a significant portion of the fish's energy. I don't remember the number, unfortunately, but it was a lot. So the fish is re working really hard to keep fresh water from invading. Now you put that fish in a stressful environment, say it's being shipped, or it's being moved to a new home, or it's in a, a dirty aquarium, or it's not getting proper nutrition, and anything like that. And now it's really hard for that fish to maintain homeostasis, to keep fresh water from invading it. Because it's fighting against all these other factors which are draining its energy, okay? So what salt does, if you get new fish in, and you put salt in the tank, five grams per liter, then that surrounds the fish with salty water. So it doesn't have to work so hard to keep fresh water from invading its, its body because there's less um, osmotic pressure. Since the, the water surrounding the fish has salt in it, there's less uh, pressure, there's less need for that water to invade the fish. Now it's not full salt water by any means, but you're just trying to take the edge off. You're trying to make it so the fish doesn't have to work so hard to keep that fresh water from invading. And that's what adding salt to an aquarium does. So if you have fish that are in a stressful situation or are fighting a disease or have an open wound, because if they have an open wound, then fresh water's definitely charging into their body because they're, the whole casing, which prevents that from happening to some degree, is damaged. Um, then salt, five grams per liter, really, really helps. So that's what salt does. So I don't know if I would call that a medicine, but I, it definitely helps a fish when it needs to conserve its energy for other uses than maintaining osmotic homeostasis. So I hope that, I know that was short and hopefully that was clear, but that's, that's why salt's useful in freshwater fish. Michael Brandel, another thing I found interesting is baby brine losing lots of nutritional value after the first molt. Feed within eight to 16 hours of hatching before the molt. Correct, yeah. So yeah, baby brine shrimp are basically a lot of yummy fat. They're basically an egg yolk <laughs> and some protein that's moving around. And they use that energy, that egg yolk, to molt and move to the second instar stage. And when they do that, because they have to use a lot of that energy to make that happen, 
then there's less nutrition in their body is kind of the long and short of what I think that presentation that Michael's citing talked about. Yes, feeding them before they molt is, is very helpful. What is this? Mr. Zen throwing down 20 bucks. Mr. Zen, thank you so much. Lefty3213A said, thanks for all the info, Dan. Hey, you're welcome, Lefty. And Mr. Zen, thanks for the super chat. Always appreciated, never required, but it does make the wife super happy. Dragon Lair, okay, Bob, at Dan's Fish, squeezing out a precock spawning mop today. A Dario male fell out on the counter. Ooh, he was up in the mop eating rainbow eggs when I pulled the mop. Well, smart guy for him. He's got caviar. Hope he's okay. Hope he made a Dragon Lair. Sorry to hear that happen, but yeah, fish eat fish eggs. I mean, for sure. <laughs> for sure, I'm not surprised. Especially, especially with a little guy like that, because... If you watch Dario, they just cruise around. They're micro predators, right? So they cruise around and they're just scanning all the time for any little thing they can go and eat real quick. So it makes sense he would do that. Hope he's okay. And now you know why you weren't getting. Uh... Someone's calling me from Oklahoma. Well, they'll have to wait. Um, now you'll get more eggs now that you know he was doing that. New Mexico Aquatics, what is the best temp for breeding funnel Panchax Gardneri? What are the best conditioning foods? Thank you, little Bobby. So with funnel of Panchax, it's generally recommended low to mid 70s. 75's fine, 78's fine. It's basically a production versus longevity thing. If your goal is to churn out lots and lots and lots of eggs as quickly as possible, you might want to keep them 78 to 80 degrees. Um, generally, we think Achilles fish, we keep them lower than that because we're trying to extend lifespan. But if you keep them warmer, that species in particular, if it's clean and well oxygenated, a gardener I can take that temperature and they'll, they'll produce lots of eggs. They'll require more food because their metabolism is a lot higher. But they'll they'll produce lots of eggs at that temperature. What I would suggest though is I would keep them around 75 degrees or so and that's a good medium. They'll produce for you but they won't burn out as quickly as if you kept them at a higher temperature. So hopefully, little Bobby, hopefully that uh, answers your question but you can keep them down to the low 70s even the high 60s. Although with garden they like it a little warmer. I'd say low 70s to mid 70s no problem. Um, and they'll still breed for you, but they won't produce as much because their metabolism is slower at those temps. Young Fish Aquatics. If I win, you can give them to Sand Creek Aquatics. Yep, we've established that. T-Shot. Why does my sponge filters have some bubbles coming out of the sponge itself? I have an air stone in them. Is it because my air hose is too long? Um, so my guess is either it's a new sponge filter and you put it in and all the um, atmosphere that was trapped in the, all the little bits of sponge, right? Deep inside the sponge, when you put it in the water, a lot of air gets trapped in there. And it takes a while for that to dissipate and dissolve out into the water. So if it's a new sponge, that's very normal. And it'll take, oh, it can take a few days, a week even sometimes for that to all go away. You know, sometimes so much this you'll come in the morning, the sponge will be floating again, um, especially if you did a large water change. Now, if it's not new, then yeah, you probably just have the air stone set in a way that it's going up into the sponge. That, that would be my guess. Fish dreams, heat pack or no heat pack going from Florida to New York at this time, not overnight. Well, Florida, definitely no heat pack. Let's check. So this is your new best friend, Fish Dreams, weather.com. So you can tell where I've been sending fish. <laughs> That's what I've looked up fairly recently. So New York, let's, where in New York? Let's say Astoria. Astoria, New York, just so we have somewhere specific. 10 day forecast. If you're sending on Monday, it won't get there till it's gonna be 
57 to 71, 73 to 61, 60 to 75. Um, in that case, I would say, okay, so here's your problem. It's going to be darn hot, I'm assuming. Uh, I won't take the time to look it up right now, but I'm assuming it's going to be really darn hot in Florida. But it's pretty cool up in New York. It's not cold, but it's cool. So I would say most fish, maybe not, you know, if it's not discus or rams or something like that, most fish aren't going to need a heat pack. If it's in the low 70s to 60 degrees in New York, then take the median temperature, and that's where it's likely to be when it arrives. So we're talking upper 60s, which for most fish is fine for shipping. Um, if it's a species that has high temperature requirements, then I don't think I would send them anyway but overnight, honestly, because there's no way to put a heat pack in on your end, because it could be sitting in New York or, or I'm sorry, in Florida, I don't know, it could take a day or two to get out of Florida, depending on your shipping method, before it gets to New York and it could overheat. So if it's a sensitive fish or a fish that can't take lower temperatures, then I would choose a different method of shipping and then it'll get there and it won't have time to have totally cooled off. Um, it should be fine. Now there's a couple things you can do to mitigate heat loss in, in shipping. One is without using a heat pack. One is really good styrofoam liner that is tight. Um, and if, if it's not tight enough for everything to meet up and stay squished together well, then you might need to like put some tape in there or something or get a, a styrofoam box that is molded instead of sheets. It's all one piece with a lid. That can help. Another thing is think water volume. So water retains heat really well. So if you use a little larger box than you normally would need to, and you put a couple extra bags of water in there that are empty of fish, but have water in there, then that creates a temperature kind of stabilization for you that can help. But if they're delicate or they need to be kept really warm, then I wouldn't do it um, unless it was next day shipping or overnight shipping. Just because of that heat differential, that's going to be hard. It's a lot easier when you're shipping from a cold location to a hot location because you can put in a heat pack that'll burn out quickly, that'll only last a day, let's say, a 24-hour heat pack. And then by the time it gets from, I don't know, New York down to Florida via priority mail, the heat pack's pretty much burned out. But it's tricky when you're shipping from warm weather to cold weather. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Hope that's helpful. Probably not what you wanted to hear, but um, hope that's helpful. Alrighty. W. Marion. Maybe it's a well-known story dance fish, but why Wyoming? Um, I'll tell you in just a sec. I just saw Punchy Paint is here. Hey, Pam, I just want to let you know I'm thinking of you and your family. Uh, hope you're okay. Glad you're okay enough to be here and um, thinking about you. I love you. I really do. Um, w. Marion. Maybe it's a well-known story, but why Wyoming? So basically, I moved to Wyoming for my kids. Um, I was in Southern California at the time, and my wife and I were having a good old time in Southern California. We had kids, still having a good old time. And then my oldest got old enough that we had to start thinking about putting her in kindergarten. And we started looking at the schools in our area and realized there were no schools in our area that we were comfortable putting our daughter in. Um, I was not fresh. Uh, actually, when my daughter was born, I was still in grad school. Um, by the time she was ready for kindergarten, I was I hadn't been out of grad school that long, still had a lot of student loans. You know, we couldn't afford to live in a fancy area in Los Angeles. So um, the areas or private school or anything. So the areas that the, the options available, we were just like, ooh, we can't put our kid here. This just is not good. So we started looking for um, everywhere for small, for like we thought a medium-sized city, maybe 500,000 people to a million people, something like that, um, that 
we could go to and find a good school there and raise and have our kids go to school there. And so we started looking and while I was looking, I came across a job um, in Sheridan, Wyoming, and I applied for it along with several other places. And Wyoming was the first place to call me and offer me the job. So I moved here because the schools are good here and I had a job here. And so, you know, it, it seemed like a good place for our kids. So that's why we moved. I'm glad I did because Sheridan, Wyoming has just about the cleanest, purest, best water you're going to find in North America. And it's soft, which is amazing, naturally soft and fantastic. And so for a fish keeper, I didn't move here knowing that about the water. But once I moved here and figured that out, I was like, no way. I'd never had soft water in my life. Everywhere I've lived, the water's been like liquid rocks, super hard. Um, and so that's why, that's why I moved. I wanted to put our kids in a, a good school. And we're glad we did. Uh, they go to a blue ribbon school and um, it's, it's, it's a fantastic place to raise kids. Brian, all the fish arrived perfectly last week and I even have sparkling grommies breeding. Woohoo! Male built a bubble nest in a cichlid cave and is guarding eggs. Thanks again. That's awesome, Brian. I'm so glad to hear that. Sparkling grommies went and bred for you, huh? Hashtag breeding is pleasure. Indeed. Indeed it is. If you're doing it right. Um, oh, that's great, Brian. Thanks for letting me know. Fish dreams throwing down $2.99. <laughs> oh, I can die happy now. I am Fish Dreams hero. My hero, says the fox cat. Thanks, Fish Dreams. I appreciate that. Thanks for the super chat. Always appreciated. Never required. And I've never seen a cuter sticker in my life. Rockford fish keeping. The Brazil thing, does that include zebra plecos? Um, There was no mention, I was there. I didn't see anything in the law that prohibited them, but I'm not sure. I'm, I think it would, but there's probably some species that they're gonna um, restrict. It did specifically talk about endangered fish um, and it didn't say they're prohibited. It said endangered fish We'll, we'll have to go through these procedures to make sure that everything's done sustainably and all that. So there were some extra check marks for that, but it didn't mention um, zebra pleco specifically. Tiffany Medima, I attended the e-conference, loved it, and took their advice to bust out our microscope. I found nasty parasites, but I'm having a very hard time confirming what I found. What do I do? Yeah, that's gonna be my problem too. I don't own a, a microscope. That was a good presentation, by the way. There was a presentation called Microscopes Don't Bite, where a veterinarian was like, okay, dust off your microscope, it's not gonna hurt you," and went through the basics of how to use it and identify parasites. Um, I asked them that question because I was like, I might find some stuff, but I'm not going to know how to identify it. And one of the suggestions, the only suggestion really, was that you take pictures or video and that there's a Facebook group called World Aquatic Veterinarian Association, where if you post a picture or a video, um, someone might chime in and say, oh, th that's this. So that was the only real suggestion. Um, none of them volunteered to, oh, send it to me, I'll help you out. You know, none of that happened. Um, <laughs> and it was a little tentative on whether that Facebook group would in fact do much of that. But that was the one place that they suggested, World Aquatic Veterinarian Association group on Facebook. Now it sounded from what they were saying that that's not the purpose of that group, and it's probably not something that, you know, if a bunch of us hobbyists jump on and just start 
randomly saying, what's this? What's this? You know, they might get annoyed. I don't know. But um, that's the one thing that they said. So the other thing is they did list all those different books and things on fish medicine and stuff that might help identify. But I don't know. That's going to be my problem. Um, the fish vet or the fish doctor on YouTube, Dr. Richmond Lowe, um, has shares some videos and things that might help. When he shows stuff on his slides, he'll show you what he sees in the microscope. But I don't know. That's going to be my problem, too. I'm going to find stuff and be like, well, there's something there. <laughs> Until I find a group that can help with that. Sand Creek Aquatics, $1.99 with a thumbs up. Well, thanks, Sand Creek. I appreciate the super chat and the uh, thumbs up. Thanks so much. Tiffany, I'm glad you, glad you attended, glad you liked it. And if you find a place with that kind of information, if you would let me know, I'm, I'm in need of that too. Michael Wilson, I heard this week that Hikari may have stopped shipping or gone out of business. Not sure if it's accurate. Oh, geez, I hope not. Ah. I hope not. I love Hikari. Their food's great. Best frozen bloodworms I've found. And let's see, right now I'm feeding sinking carnivore pellets from Hikari, frozen brine shrimp from Hikari, frozen bloodworms from Hikari, um, micro pellets from Hikari, and Viber bites. Like, I use a lot of Hikari. I re I've liked it for decades. Oh, I hope that's wrong. Oh, man, I hope you're mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> Rockford Fishkeeping, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, I saw it. Electro Fry, oh, I know he's busy. I've been waiting for Xenotoka, which one? Lion's Eye to come available for a year and a half and still waiting. Yeah, Greg Sage at Select Aquatics is busy. Now, still, if you're looking for live bears, he's a good first choice. Check him out. There might be stuff that he has available. But yeah, Lion's Eye, looks like it's been a while. <laughs> That's how you know he's good, right? He's got a waiting list. It's like a fine restaurant, fine dining establishment. Andrew W., could you breed the bitterlings without the clams? I don't think so. Um, I mean, you might be able to... No, I kind of doubt it. I was thinking if you set up like an artificial ceramic thing, could you trick the female into laying her eggs in it? Maybe, but she literally inserts her... Um, ovipositor into the clams intake into its gills basically and so there's got to be some suction probably to suck that down into the right spot um, hold the jokes people I know what you're thinking um, to deposit them in the right spot and then the other thing is that the clam is actively pumping water over the eggs during their development so without that I bet they would just die so I don't think so Andrew they're so specialized that I'd have a could someone rig something up? Maybe with a little pump and a ceramic thing with little holes in it. Maybe, but it'd be awfully hard. The, the, the eggs are small and so you kind of have to have that, the different filter tissues of the clam there or the muscle or whatever to capture the eggs so they don't just go into the gills and out the, you know, just get pumped back out. Um, I'm not that up on clam and muscle anatomy, as you can tell, but yeah, that's what, that's that's my suspicion. I don't think so. The Zen Ginger, can the bitterlings go in a tank with smaller grow out fancy goldfish, hillstream loaches, and pandagar? Hillstream loaches, sure, as long as there's enough benthic food that the, see, hillstream loaches are just slow feeders. so. As long as there's enough food for them, pandagar, sure, pandagar go nuts for food. They're pretty quick feeders. Fancy goldfish, maybe, my, my thought of that though is I'm thinking like, you know, little, lots of fancy fins and rotund bodies and slow feeders. So it, I think it depends on how quick to the food those fancy goldfish are, what strain you have. Rockford Fishkeeping, is there a liquid you can put in the tank to check current, like fish safe food coloring? Um, yes, 
uh, I used to work in a very large establishment that did that with methylene blue. Not a ton, you're not trying to oxidize anything, just a little bit, just so you can see the color. Um, and basically there's this central pump and then an artesian well where, where the water bubbled up and then the central pump to pump that to, through the system. But this place was, this was African cichlids, really super hard water. And all the little valves that fed the aquariums, each individual aquarium would clog regularly, like all the time. <laughs> and so what we would do is put some methylene blue in the container that held the incoming water from the well, and the pump would pump that out through the system, so we would see which tanks didn't turn blue. So if any of the tanks weren't turning blue, we knew that the, um, the water feeding that tank, the valve was clogged, then we'd have to take it out and clean it or replace it. So uh, did that with methylene blue. Low doses, you're not trying to, ex methylene blue is an oxidizer and you don't probably want to oxidize your tank heavily. Kids Aquatics throwing down 50 bucks. Thank you, Bob Kaler. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Always appreciated. Never required, but it makes Brenda super happy. And um, <laughs> it's not Pippi Longstocking, but it's the next best thing. It's Pippi Longstocking's brother. <laughs> that must be Bob telling me that we're just about out of time. And so we are. We've only got a couple minutes left, so let me get to a couple more questions. And then we'll do the drawing for the bitterlings. Rockford Fishkeeping and I have brand new jewel cichlid babies. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a pretty fish. Lefty asking, what are your degrees in? I heard grads, I finished grad school in two weeks. My degrees are in biochemistry and neuroscience. No, I'm joking. They're in theater. I'm a theater geek, I'm a thespian, so my degrees are in theater. So I moved here for a professorship. I, I'm, I was a tenured professor at a local college teaching theater. And then the fish business started growing and I had to choose between the two and I chose the fish business. All right, I think uh, Rockford Fish Keeping, this might help. The microscope thing references the disease pages I sent. You have some drawings and what to look for. Yeah, yeah, so there's some reference pages and stuff. Um, there's some books with pictures and things like that. And Rockford Fishkeeping was nice enough to send me some scans of some of that stuff. But um, so many of them look so similar that I'm not gonna be really comfortable without having someone that really knows how to identify stuff helping me out, at least not at the beginning. Wichita Falls Fishkeeper, I'll catch the replay, but did you have any questions that didn't get answered during the seminar? No, I think they all got answered. Yeah, they were really good about answering the questions. The funny thing is that there were several Daniels, so I had to register using my name, Daniel, you know, for, because your registration and your credit card was the same information, so I had to use like full names and everything because it had to match my credit card. And so when I paid for other folks to attend the conference in order to use my credit card I had to use my name <laughs> so there were <laughs> more than one Daniel there <laughs> I think it might have been confusing to the moderator <laughs> okay we're out of time I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question or comment but um, it is 830 and so we're gonna roll on to the giveaway and end this live stream so to win some bitterlings. The winner is Goose Not Maverick. Hey, Goose Not Maverick. If you're here, please let us know. You've got one minute to tell us you're here. And then I will um, have you email me, dan at dancefish.com, and uh, send me your first and last name and your mailing address. If you do that, I'll send the bitterlings out to you on Monday. So let's see if you're here. I'm pretty sure you are. All right, this is important. Kaylor's Aquatics saying Pam will not be on tonight, but Sand Creek Aquatics will host a special stream in Pam's time slot. Okay, so Pam's uh, obvi you know, taking the, the night off, as, as she should, and um, Sand Creek Aquatics 
we'll be streaming in that slot. So if you have a yen for more fish stuff, Sam Creek Aquatics has got you covered. Oh no, six more seconds, Goose. I'm not seeing Goose. There, okay. <laughs> 58 seconds, you made it, you made it. <laughs> Man, <clears throat> talk about cutting it close last minute maneuver there. I just put water directly into my lungs. I drank down the wrong pipe. That was no fun. All right, cool. So Goose.Maverick, send me an email, dan at dancefish.com. First and last name and your mailing address. I'll send you those bitter leans on Monday. And um, if you could do that by midnight tonight, that would be great. Noon tomorrow is the hard cutoff. Marlin Chaser got more bandit cichlids from you today. Thanks a lot. They look great like the last batch. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear it, Marlin Chaser. Glad they made it. And sorry for the mix-up. Um, I forgot that Monday was a holiday, so FedEx would not be shipping. And uh, I, I just uh, thought I'd be shipping Monday. And so there was a little bit of confusion there. Um, but sorry about that, Marlin Chaser. But I'm glad it all worked out. All right, that's it. I'll be back next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Until then, I hope you all do well. Um, Pam, I'm thinking of you. If you need anything, you know how to get a hold of me. And uh, just, I love you. Just know that. And I hope things get better soon. For the rest of you all, I'll see you next Wednesday. Hope you have a good one. Thanks to everyone that left a super chat. Thanks to my mods. Thanks to all the questions and comments. For all you lurkers. Oh gotta switch all you lurkers thank you as well and everyone watching the replay thanks for being here till next time have a good one